Today we're going to learn how to identify all the members of the genus Esox here in North America with a lot of other information on these fun to catch species. If you are fishing anywhere in these zones in North America, then it's probably a good idea that you can identify these species. The Musculunge is the largest member of this group. The Northern Pike is not too far back in size and we'll briefly discuss that Silver Pike variant. We'll also discuss the Tiger Musculunge, the hybrid between the Northern Pike and the Musculunge, and of course we will cover all the pickerels that includes both subspecies of the American pickerel and we'll throw in other tips on how to ID other possible hybrids. Now, if you're in a rush to ID a fish right now, just go to koa.org forward slash Esox key. This is a quick app I made where you put in values for up to four features on your fish. Most identifications can be determined with this app, but definitely not all of them because there are plenty of tricky to ID specimens that have overlapping features and you'll have to dig deeper for an ID, which this video will prepare you for. And a friendly reminder to not lip or hold any of these species as you would a largemouth bass. They have very, very sharp teeth. What's up? I am Koa and this is KNFS where we anglers are always learning and sharing knowledge about fishing and fishes and the genus of Esox is one of my favorites. I fished for these species for over three decades, captured all of the North American species and subspecies as well as some natural hybrids. I've also extensively researched all of these species to bring this information to anglers in a way that no one has ever done before. And this video is an extension of my new Esox guide found at koa.org forward slash Esox. This is a free to view KNFS community resource for y'all. And I know there's a lot of content to cover in this video, so grab your favorite brew and soak it all in, or feel free to use the chapters on the scroll bar that I put on this video so you can hop around. But I do suggest that you at least watch the use the for section so you can properly learn how to examine the most important features. First and foremost, let's quickly go over the basic features of all members of Esox. There will be an elongated body, a duckbill-like snout that has many sharp teeth, a single dorsal fin far back on the body that sits almost directly above an anal fin of similar size, and there will be a forked caudal fin. Juveniles will have these same features, though juveniles will have different colors and patterns compared to their adult forms. Since these species of Esox are primarily freshwater species, occasionally found in brackish waters, the only other species outside of Esox that often get confused with them are the gars. And the simplest way to tell a gar from any member of Esox is to note that the tail fin is forked. Gars have a rounded tail fin externally. The scales of gars are larger, diamond shaped, and don't overlap. And these are ganoid scales on gars. So if you touch these scales, they're very hard, like armor. While on Esox, these scales are softer, smaller, roundly, and do overlap. A lateral scale count easily shows that all gars have fewer lateral scales than all members of Esox. Also, what is obvious on most species of gar is that they will have a really, really long snout compared to any of the pike, pickerels, and musky. Use the four. Most identifications within this genus can be cleared up by just examining four meristic features. And meristic features are just countable features. One, two, three, four, just like that, easy to do. We will cover each one of these in detail, but anytime you catch a pike, pickerel, or musky, or even a possible hybrid, I want you to use the four. Remember this, use the four. And you can kind of think of the Star Wars, use the force as a sort of memory device. These four features are the same features that get plugged into my quick ID app on the website. And all the links I mentioned today are in the description below this video. And to quickly save this video in your YouTube library for an easy future reference, you just toss a happy thumb on it and any super thanks goes right back into making free to view content for the KNFS community here and possibly extra luck on your next fishing outing. So although patterning and coloration are very important to look at when identifying these species and even the hybrids, these formeristic features are more reliable to start with because they can work at pretty much every stage of development and should always be examined. Some hybrids will look exactly like one of their parent species, and it will really be the meristic and morphometrics that can solve the ID. Or at least tell you, hmm, this might be a hybrid because it doesn't fit pure species features. So now we're going to go through how to examine each one of these four. 
The first feature of the four that you should always check is the scalation or how many scales are covering the cheek and the operculum. And you'll just approximate a percentage of coverage. Make sure to have the light shimmer correctly in your photos so that you make sure to see all the scales. The cheek is right behind the eye with a few different bones under there. And on this musky, we can clearly see that there are scales on the top portion of the cheek, but no scales on the bottom portion. This would be considered a partially scaled cheek. On this chain pick roll, we can clearly see the cheek is almost entirely scaled. The operculum is right behind the cheek, and it's composed of four different bones, the preopercle, the interopercle, the subopercle, and the opercle. You don't really need to memorize those, just know the general area. On this muskie, we can see that not all of the operculum is scaled, though there is a line of scales running down the opercle and even on the preopercle there, which is actually fairly common on the muskie. This would be considered a partially scaled operculum, chain pickerel here has a mostly scaled perculum except lacking some scales on the preopercle there. So for my quick ID app, I consider anything more than 75% to be mostly scaled and anything that is 75% or less to be partially scaled just to simplify the data entry. And it's only on the youngest of specimens when the scales on the cheek and operculum might not be obvious or fully developed. The second valuable meristic to analyze are the lateral scales, and these will be tedious to count on juveniles, but more than likely very helpful for an ID. Technically, this count should be taken along the main lateral line from behind the gill plate to the hyperal crease, which is very near the end of the caudal peduncle there. But on some members of ESOX, the main lateral line will be hard to find because there are so many poured scales, especially on red fin pickerel. Often it's practical to just pick the most posterior central scale on the caudal peduncle that's not on the tail fin, and then go back a scale or two to approximate where the hyperal crease is, if not analyzing an actual specimen, and follow that row of scales all the way until you reach the back of the gill plate. You just count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, etc. It's always best to count twice and average your two counts. The submandibular pores are found on the underside of the fish's head on small specimens. Usually anything smaller than 10 to 12 inches, you'll probably need a magnifying glass. On pickerels, these pores are very hard to see because they often have a lot of other flecking and spotting going on, especially young ones. These pores are just holes with sensory cells inside. Only count the obvious fully developed pores. It's best to get a count on both sides. And be careful not to count scars, black spots, and other markings that are not pores. Finally, there are the branchiostical rays, and these are just bones inside the branchiostical membrane found on the underside of the head sort of creeping up on the lateral sides there. These branchioscal rays should be fairly obvious to the naked eye, but you can also feel them as they will be hard compared to that surrounding membrane. Make sure not to count the subopercle there, which is a much larger bone above the last branchioscal ray. Getting the count on both sides is best, but at least counting one side is very important. It's important to grab good photos of your fish if you plan on IDing it later or confirming your field ID. These are four photos you should always get. A photo of the entire side of the fish as the fish lies flat. A side shot of the head from snout to gill plate. Make sure all the scales are shimmering fully on the cheek and operculum. Get an underneath shot of the bottom of the jaws that includes those submandibular pores. And make sure you get a shot of the branchioscal rays that's splayed out and countable in at least one photo. And finally, as a bonus photo, get one of the top of the head. And this will be important if you ever think you have a tiger muskie. Also place a flat ruler in that photo as well as the one of the fish lying flat. And that will help with the morphometrics calculator I created that'll help differentiate tiger muskie. Now we'll examine each one of these species in detail, making relevant comparisons to other species along the way. Let's start with the musculange, Isox masquinange, a fish that is endemic only to North America. This is an approximated range map of the native range, and here is the approximation of introductions where musky populations currently exist. And this may not include all musky populations, as various states and provincial fisheries are always changing uh, their stocking locations. So let's use the four. We'll start with a cheek and a perculum scalation. The muskie will typically have a partially scaled cheek and a partially scaled operculum. The cheek is usually about 50% scaled or less, sometimes 60 to 70%, and rarely up to 80% scaled. While the operculum is usually 30 to 50% scaled, sometimes up to 60. These two are both muskies, but we can clearly see the scalation coverage is a bit different. 
The muskie is the only pure species within the genus that will almost always have a partially scaled cheek and a partially scaled operculum. All the pickerels have a mostly scaled cheek and a mostly scaled operculum, and the northern pike almost always has a mostly scaled cheek and a partially scaled operculum. The tiger muskie lens usually has a cheek and operculum scalation closer to its northern pike parent. The operculum will be partially scaled while the cheek is often mostly scaled. So checking out the cheek on a possible tiger muskie lunge may be extremely helpful for differentiating against muskie. However, some tigers, tiger muskies will have a cheek that appears partially scaled, capable of looking just like a pure muskie cheek. And this chart is one that I made available for you to download on your phone as a KNFS community resource. I'll probably update it every now and again as I encounter more data. This is a cumulative source of data from many publications, including my own data covering the ranges of all species. Now a chart like this is actually most helpful if you're actually looking at the populations within that water body. This chart, keep in mind, it covers all the ranges, all populations, so it's very broad. Again, the muskie stands out from the other members of ESOCs by usually having more lateral scales. Muskie usually have 145 to 160 lateral scales with a full range of 140 to 176. The northern pike is the only other pure species to have overlap with the muskie. The tiger muskie hybrid has a small overlap too. But if you ever get a muskie looking fish and you want to confirm that ID later, that lateral shot count in these scales is going to be very important. Even for a silver pike variant if you think you get one of those. The muskie tends to have the most submandibular pores within ESOX, usually with a total count of 12 to 18, sometimes 19 to 20, and on small occasions a low count of like 11. And that's summing the counts from both sides. The pickerels usually show that 4 to 4 count for a total of 8, but it's not terribly uncommon for them to show 7 or 9, nothing close to what a muskie should show, and even counts of 10 or 11 have rarely appeared on the pickerels. The northern pike usually shows a 5 5 count, Again, sometimes higher and sometimes lower. The tiger muskie lunge usually has 9 to 13 pores. And about a quarter of the time, that summation will be a little higher in the muskie lunge range at 14 to 16. And I even found a single reporting of a 9-8 count on a tiger muskie. Tiger muskie lunge IDs will require looking at many features. The branchiostical rays are probably the least important feature of the top four when you're looking at a muskie because other features should settle the ID. But most muskie typically have 16 to 18 branchiostical rays, where 19 to 20 counts show up with moderate frequency. And there's just a good deal of overlap with most of the other species in this group, except for the redfin and grass pickerels. Muskie lunge patterning is highly variable and changes during development. You'll have specimens that are almost entirely without patterning, usually called clear or immaculate. However, this clear phenotypic expression still usually has some pattern on the last third of the body, even if it is very faded. Then you'll get those muskies only with bars, and then there's the muskies with spots, then there are the ones with bars and spots, and all of these graphics I made are based on live, actual specimens. So those are real patterns from real fish. And let's just talk about muskies and subspecies to clear things up. Although certain subspecies have been described for the muskie lunge, these subspecies are not currently recognized as subspecies by most authorities. It's only been in recent decades that genetic studies have started better evaluating and comparing different muskie populations to determine if certain strains, races, ecotypes, whatever you want to call them, deserve that taxonomic description at the subspecies level. So there still remains an extensive amount that needs to be studied and explored regarding muskie genetics and evolution before confident subspecies descriptions can be confidently applied, if at all. So even now, it remains unclear the exact genetics responsible for the bar in spotting and immaculate phenotypes, where all three of these types can be found in the same water in some areas. So my ESOX guide adheres to the current authoritative majority consensus by not recognizing any of the previously suggested subspecies. A muskie is just a muskie, no subspecies exist. However, it is very important to recognize that natural genetic variability does exist between many populations of muskie where these genetically unique populations are commonly referred to as strains. And strains are not subspecies but sort of similar. 
subspecies assignments are a completely different sort of taxonomic delimitation that we just don't have time to get into. But fisheries managers take good care these days to ensure that the correct strain of muskie is stocked in an appropriate water source. Often the goal of these stocking events is just to keep unique strains of muskie populations separated so as to not mix genetically distinct populations. Therefore, you preserve the genetic integrity of those local populations. Though in the past, before fisheries managers were even considering you know, these genetically distinct populations, they already mixed a whole bunch of uh, genetically distinct populations. And so some areas are sort of already SOL on that one. So musky lunge patterning is highly variable, but conveniently does not resemble the northern pike patterning. The subadult and adult northern pike will always be showing those jelly bean dots on the side. That's a light pattern on a dark background. Well, musky do not show these jelly bean spots, and it's always a darker pattern on a lighter background. You'll notice both adults of these species will have spotting in the fins. As juveniles, the musky lunge will develop spotting in the fins before the northern pike. At least as early as three inches, musky usually will have some spots in the fins developing while a northern pike, that spotting usually doesn't start to show up until about six or seven inches in total length maybe a little earlier in some populations. Musky lunge are mostly confused with the hybrid tiger musky lunge, both the juveniles and adults, as well as the silver pike. And we'll discuss that more when we get to the tiger musky and the silver pike variant sections. But as far as the musky lunge hybridizing with other species, it's only the musky northern pike hybrid, aka the tiger musky, that's ever been observed in nature. However, in artificial settings, Researchers have successfully created musky hybrids with the redfin pickerel, the grass pickerel, and the chain pickerel. So yes, the gametes, the eggs and sperm, are compatible to create survivable offspring. But there are just too many natural barriers, both physical and psychological, between these fishes for anything but the tiniest chance to see these hybrids in nature. It would be a very rare sighting to see a natural hybrid of these. I would love to see it. But if we think about some of the natural barriers between these fishes, most of the musky range is outside the ranges of the pickerels. Musky also spawn later. And most adult muskies are more likely to consider most grass pickerel and redfin pickerel as a meal rather than a mating option. And to answer a question I often get about these fishes, yes, they will eat each other. And yes, most definitely they are cannibalistic. These are all the known naturally occurring hybrids. And I did throw a chart together on the site that has some of the recorded features of these hybrids, as well as some artificially produced hybrids for your reference. The muskie is often associated with cool water systems and not cold or warm water systems. They can be found in a creek. Uh, they can be found in lakes and rivers of various sizes. And like all sockets and esocks, the muskie is often associated with vegetation. Though this habitat type is most exclusively used by young specimens, while larger muskie are well known to spend much more time in deeper water during various times of the year. The size of the muskie lunge is suggested to attain up to 6 feet or 72 inches from a Page and Burr publication. I could not find any verifiable specimen to confirm this. What I do know is that some of the current verifiable angling records are just below 65 inches and just under 70 pounds, which is still pretty damn big. That's more than a foot longer than this specimen. And it's the females that attain these massive sizes. Most males in most populations will never exceed 50 inches, though some males will. Most musky lunge will reach sexual maturity at five years old, while some will be three to four. Males typically reach sexual maturity sooner than the females. This 26 inch specimen is about the size when sexual maturity kicks in. And when you're looking at these age to length charts, it's important to remember that these charts are really only mostly accurate if that chart is based off of the exact water body you pulled your muskie from. Even within the same state or the same province, muskies grow at different rates and attain different max sizes on different bodies of water. So here I just modified a Wisconsin DNR publication to add some images, and this gives a general idea how old a muskie is at different sizes over all of Wisconsin's waters. Some bodies of water will never be able to produce those 50 inch plus muskie. And that's usually gonna be on a shallow, highly vegetated system that doesn't provide that deep habitat, that provides that next trophic level where 
bigger prey items are there. Big fish need big prey items. The general rule of thumb is that bigger bodies of water with fairly good depths will have more of the bigger specimens. I tossed on some important handling, landing, and gear tips on the site if you want to check that out. If you are new to musky fishing, I absolutely love musky fishing, but it's very important to bring certain gear to ensure that you safely land and release one of these beautiful fish. There's also more musky info on the musky page. So let's move on to the northern pike. And the northern pike is actually a circumpolar species as it's found in Eurasia with a few other uh, Isakid species. But my guide only talks about North American species, so I'm only going to focus on the North American range and a big range it is. The northern pike is truly a cold water species as well as a cool water species, while that muskie is more of a cool water species. The introduced part of this range was difficult for me to approximate because almost every contiguous state in the U.S. has had northern pike over the last couple hundred years at some point in time because of human introductions. But many of these populations didn't survive and a number of states just don't want northern pike anymore and have worked to eradicate uh, past introduced populations. So there very well may be some populations of northern pike not on my map here. So let's use the four. The operculum on the northern pike is partially scaled, while that cheek is mostly scaled. Checking the operculum is very helpful when distinguishing this fish against any of the pickerels, as the pickerels have a mostly scaled operculum, and the northern pike has a partially scaled operculum. The lateral line scales are highly variable on this species and probably won't be too useful for most IDs. Normally, there's 120 to 135 lateral scales, but it's still helpful to get the lateral scale count as it might help differentiate the fish from the pickerels or be useful in a hybrid assessment. The submandibular pores of the northern pike are almost always going to be 5 on each side for a total of 10, but it's not terribly uncommon to find a 6 count on one side or even a 4 count. On the same day I nabbed one with a 4 count on a side and a 6 count on a side, as well as a bunch of 5-5 five, five counters. It's those 4-4 four, four counts that are very rare on the northern pike, and those 4-4 four, four counts are typical on the pickerels. The branchiosical rays may be helpful differentiating this fish from American pickerel subspecies as they will have fewer rays. And from the muskies, the muskie will typically have more rays. This feature likely won't help too much with the chain pickerel. So let's talk patterning. As we mentioned earlier, the northern pike is known for that distinct jelly bean pattern along its body. And this pattern tends to vary depending on the population. Sometimes the spots are very roundly or more elongated or even very very elongated. Usually it's a combination. Sometimes they'll vary in color from almost pure white to dark yellow. And this jelly bean pattern only starts to appear on the mid-stage juvenile to sub-adults, but it's fully visible on adults. Usually during the transition into adulthood, the slanted bars are still along the body while spotting starts to show up around those slanted bars. The adult pattern looks somewhat similar to chain pickerel adult patterning and sometimes the patterning on both species will look very similar, and that's why you need to knock out those four main meristics. And there is a morph of the northern pike called the silver pike. And the silver pike is not a different species, just a different phenotypic morph. A silver pike completely lacks any of the normal pike patterning. There are no jelly bean spots. The silver pike has a grayish, silverish, bluish coloration with gold flecks on the scales. The body tends to be thinner, than the normal northern pike variant. The eye is a bit larger and the fins are usually with less spotting. They also don't usually get much bigger than 10 pounds. The silver pike gets confused with musky lunge because it really looks like an immaculate version of the musky, just with a slightly different color. The simpler way to differentiate the silver pike and the musky is just to use the four. That cheek will be mostly scaled while on the muskies it's not. The lateral scales will probably be less than 145. There will be fewer submandibular pores and there will probably be fewer branchiostical rays. Curiously enough, back in the 1930s, one of the very first artificial hybrid tiger muskies produced was produced via silver pike and muskies because they thought the silver pike was a muskie. They called it the silver muskie. But these crossings prove that Silver pike can successfully hybridize with the muskie, producing tiger muskies that look pretty much like most tiger muskies. 
We can notice that the suborbital bar or teardrop on adult northern pike is much less apparent than it is on adult chain pickerel. Usually, it's hardly seen on an adult northern pike, often just a half bar, sometimes very faded, though sometimes it's quite dark and obvious. On adult pickerel, that teardrop is always dark and elongated. But I don't want people to get wrapped up on the suborbital bar. I don't want people to be using this for IDs, really. I see too many misidentifications happen because people forget that suborbital bar is going to be different on the different stages of development. All species within ESOX will have a suborbital bar at some stage of their development, if not always throughout life. The muskie will almost always lose that bar after the first growing season. And as I dove deeper into the ESOX research, I just found that examining the slanting on the bar is not as reliable as some of the old guides previously reported. So we're gonna abandon the slanting as an ID feature. But just notice, like on a chain pickerel here, as a young juvenile, that bar just kind of slants towards the head. While as it ages into the subadult, that bar is more vertical. And then usually, as an adult, that bar is slanting back towards the tail. But again, I see misidentifications with the chain pickerel and northern pike when people only rely on the suborbital bar. And this usually happens with those subadult and late stage juvenile specimens where their patterning is very similar. Now on this late stage juvenile pike, the suborbital bar has already faded and lacks extension, but in some populations, this bar may still be very apparent and long at this size and look more like this. The quickest pattern feature to notice between northern pike and the pickerels around this size is just to notice that there is a bunch of spotting in those fins. None of the pickerels will ever have a bunch of spotting in the fins. Though, keep in mind, chain pickerel will retain two dark blotches at the base of the caudal fin. That's true sometimes, and that will even persist into the adults sometimes. So these are three different species, all of similar size and similar appearance. Trying to ID based off of the suborbital bar would be useless. We'll also notice that none of these specimens have spotting in the fins, but one of these is the northern pike. Remember, the northern pike usually doesn't develop spotting in the fins until about six to seven inches in total length, give or take. So let's go about how we would ID these small specimens. First thing I would want to do is examine the operculum to see the scalation. And this is tricky to do on small specimens because everything just sort of glistens like a scale and the scales might not even be developed enough to notice. But I'd say that we can see a partially scaled operculum on that top fish, then a mostly scaled operculum and another mostly scaled operculum. The bottom two are pickerels and the top one fits northern pike or musky. The top fish doesn't have spots in the fins like a juvenile musky would at this size. A musky at this size should also have dark blotching on the body or at least bars forming. The pattern fits a juvenile northern pike of this size with those distinct pale slanted bars. The bottom two fish are clearly showing the remnants of a lateral bar that they had as young juveniles. This graphic of a juvenile grass pickerel clearly shows how obvious this bar is on the very young. Northern pike don't ever develop a lateral bar like this as juveniles, at least not a bar free of dark pigment. To determine the bottom two species, we'd want to do a lateral scale count and count the brachiostical rays. It's just super tedious to do on these small specimens, especially from photos where there are glares, shadows, and blurs, but I'm counting about 128 to 130 on that middle specimen and about 117 on the bottom specimen. So for that middle one, the lateral scale count is well outside the redfin or grass pickerel ranges. This fish also expresses patterning like that of a transitioning chain pickerel. So we've identified the top two species as best we can from these lateral photos. Now the bottom specimen is a bit trickier. From the lateral scale count, it's hitting the far end of the lateral scale count for redfin and grass pickerel, and it's also within the far end range of the chain pickerel. Now the ID is easy to solve because I know the range. It's in Southern Illinois, and so that's only a grass pickerel there. There are no chain pickerel. But counting the brachiostical rays would help confirm this ID if this was in chain pickerel range as well. And I should have taken a better photo in this swamp, but there appear to be 11 brachiostical rays, maybe 12 in case that blur is messing me up. Either way, the B ray count sits within the expected grass pickerel range and outside the normal range of chain pickerel. And the pattern also fits perfectly with a young adult or even a sub-adult grass pickerel. 
Often you'll run into a northern pike with a bunch of dark black spots on its body and even inside on the meat. These black spots are not part of a northern pike's typical pattern, but rather they are the fluke larvae or flatworm larvae that have been covered by cysts and black pigment. This is called black spot disease. You can still harvest and eat a fish with black spot disease. Just cook it as you normally would. And I have definitely harvested more northern pike compared to any other fish in the world. Even ones with black spot disease. But northern pike also frequently have species of tapeworms internally. And those can definitely have some serious unfavorable symptoms in us humans. So a NOAA publication suggested normal cooking, smoking to 140 degrees, or freezing the fish at zero degrees Fahrenheit for 48 hours should be done to make that meat safe. So I probably should have frozen the meat before I made pike ceviche. Northern pike in Eurasia reach far larger sizes than they do in North America. There are reports of 60, 70, even past 90 pound northern pike in Europe. In North America, we just don't seem to get northern pike that ever surpass 50 pounds. Most northern pike caught here in North America are going to be 20 to 30 inches, and anything bigger than 40 inches is considered very nice here. Northern pike can be found in lakes, rivers, creeks, and even in wetlands like marshes during that spawn migration. This species is definitely associated with dense cover and vegetation. Big northern pike can still be found in shallow vegetation, but they're also going to be found in the deeper waters, just like with the muskie. Because with deeper water systems, you get that extra trophic level. You get those bigger prey items that bigger fish can eat. Let's talk about the tiger muskie a bit more. The tiger muskie is the most encountered hybrid type within the genus. This is a cross between a muskie and a northern pike, and both crosses produce viable offspring. I mean, a female muskie and a male northern pike, and vice versa. The female muskie and male northern pike is the cross that seems to produce the most survivable, fastest growing offspring, and therefore that's the one that hatcheries are stocking with. This is just a range map I threw together combining all the introduced and native ranges of musky and northern pike. So those black X's show where we could expect natural hybrids to occur. The yellow stars are a few locations that have stocked tiger musky lunge in the last decade or so. I did not put all of them there. The tiger musky will never look like its northern pike parent. They will never have that jelly bean pattern at any point in development. And even as juveniles, they're fairly distinct with different lateral patterns and coloration. It's really the musculunge that gets confused with the tiger musculunge and vice versa. Tiger musculunge IDs should never be based 100% on color and patterning. Use the Meristics key or the app and that will most likely solve the ID. The top two features to note are that tiger muskie will more often than not have that mostly scaled cheek while the muskie has a partially scaled cheek and also that tiger muskie tend to have fewer lateral scales. The submandibular pores should be checked next and usually if it's a musky looking fish and it shows a sum of 9, 10, or 11 submandibular pores then it's a tiger musky. Sometimes all four of these meristic features will overlap as in there is no confident ID and that's when morphometrics and patterning need to be examined very closely. The subadult and adult tiger musky most typically has an elaborately patterned head. Musky don't normally show this. Usually the musky head is without pattern or it's very minimal. Though muskies with spotting on the body usually have spotting on the head. The pattern along the body of a subadult and adult tiger musky is also usually very crowded and seems unorganized. There's more tendency to see pronged bars and leopard spots. Features seen less often on musky. The patterning on the tiger musky lunge is also usually darker than what is seen on the musky. And the morphometrics will really be helpful for a tiger musky ID. And morphometrics is just a fancy word we biologists and researchers use to describe shapes and sizes of measured body parts and how they compare to other measured body parts. What's very obvious on tiger musky is that big head, most obvious on adults. The tiger musky just has a longer head compared against the body length. Both of these specimens I photographed are 36 inches, so this is truly a very convenient comparison. You can also just see how that body on the tiger musky is shorter and stockier than it is on the muskies. I also created a morphometrics calculator for differentiating tiger musky that's on the site, and I explain how to use this further in the 
Tiger Muskie hybrid breakdown video where I literally walk us through step by step how do I ID this fish. Juvenile Tiger Muskie and Muskie are very, very hard to tell apart. From the larval stage to about three, even four to five inches, these two fishes can look pretty much indistinguishable based on appearances. It's really at around the three to four inch size when Tiger Muskie start developing the hybrid pattern. These are five and a half inch specimens. And what is most obvious to notice is that the Tiger Muskie lunge has already broken the lateral dorsal bend. A reticulated pattern has replaced it. While in the Muskie, this fish usually maintains most all of that lateral bend until the end of the first growing season. So that'd be around 10 to 12 inches. A tiger muskie of this size may still show a bit more of that lateral band along the nape and farther into the dorsum, but it most likely will be broken on the posterior half. And you'll notice from the lateral view that the pale regions are reaching the dorsum or the backside, and that extends across the back, breaking the lateral dorsal band. On the muskie of this size, usually that pale region is not reaching the dorsum. Thus, most of the dorsum is dark and the lateral band remains intact. All right, let's move on to the chain pickerel, Esox niger. Chain pickerel is only found in North America, like all the pickerels, mostly in those Atlantic drainages, but also in the southern part of the greater Mississippi basin area and the Gulf drainages. Now, I didn't place the chain pickerel as introduced in the upper parts of Lake Ontario and into the mouth of the St. Lawrence River there, but it's really only been in the last 15 years, 20 years or so, where more and more chain pickerel sightings have occurred. So it's probably signaling a rain shift with our warming global temperatures, and we might even see them creep farther up the St. Lawrence. Nova Scotia is dealing with a serious infestation of non-native chain pickerel, and chain pickerel have been introduced across that Ohio River Basin in years past, but it was really hard to pinpoint what populations stuck and which ones didn't, so that's a broad estimate. So let's remember the four. There's a mostly scaled cheek and a mostly scaled operculum. The lateral line scales are usually between 120 to 135, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. The submandibular pores are usually a 4-4 count for a total of 8, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. The branchiostical rays are usually 14 to 17, but there may be some populations that tend to show 12 to 13 counts. So really just checking the operculum scalation should determine a chain pickerel from northern pike. And again, notice that chain pickerel don't have spotting in the fins while northern pike will after about seven inches or so, sometimes sooner. Again, like all asakids, the patterning changes as the fish develops. And it's only on the subadults and adults that that chain pattern shows, that chain link pattern. Determining adult chain pickerel versus adult redfin pickerel is fairly easy just based off of patterning. Redfin pickerel will never have that chain link pattern that is so characteristic of the chain pickerel. Also, the redfin pickerel has orange to red fins, while on most chain pickerel, the fins are dusky to yellowish. Not ever going to be red or that orange. But again, baristics are always best to examine, and the redfin pickerel will have fewer lateral scales as well as fewer branchiostical rays compared to the chain pickerel. And for a more confident ID, just notice that the chain pickerel usually has the longest snout length in the genus and the redfin pickerel has the shortest. Most all chain pickerel will show a snout length that exceeds or is equal to the post orbital length of the head. While in the redfin pickerel, that snout length does not exceed the post orbital length of the head. Now it's possible, but uncommon for a chain pickerel to have a slightly shorter snout length than the post orbital length of the head. You can also look at the maxilla extension. On the redfin pickerel, that maxilla extension usually extends to or past the interior margin of the pupil. While on the chain pickerel, it usually doesn't ever reach the pupil. And many times not even to the anterior margin of the eye. The chain pickerel times redfin pickerel hybrid type is probably the second most encountered hybrid in this genus. And because this video is already super long, I'm not going to get into that ID here, but I do have one fully written up hybrid breakdown on the ESOX guide to show how to ID this hybrid type if you want to read it. But I do want to talk briefly about one natural hybrid type with the chain pickerel, and that's chain pickerel times northern pike. This was the first ever naturally recorded hybrid, and it's actually not observed all that often.
All attempts to create the female Northern Pike Times male chain pickerel hybrid have failed in artificial settings. So it's fairly likely that all the natural hybrids that have been observed were a female chain pickerel and a male Northern Pike. Though the data pool is very limited, just note that the adult subadult chain pickerel pattern has never been observed on these hybrids. Rather, they've either appeared intermediate between the forms or almost just like a Northern Pike pattern. We can see on this almost 16 inch specimen that the spotting pattern has sort of remained in an organized slanted pattern that really resembles the mid-stage juvenile Northern Pike pattern. Most of these hybrids have shown a mostly scaled operculum, and that's gonna come from the chain pickerel parent. And most of them had a four to four count of submandibular pores, also coming from the chain pickerel parent. Most of the juveniles, until about six or seven inches, will be indistinguishable from Northern Pike based on color and pattern. A genetic test would almost assuredly be needed at that size. The hardest IDs in this genus between pure species will probably be the grass pickerel and the chain pickerel, and it happens on specimens about the size like we talked about before. After you use the four and you run that meristics analysis and you still get overlapping features for everything, then you really have to start relying on patterning and morphometrics. The grass pickerel has a longer snout in general than the redfin pickerel, but that snout length is still less than the post orval length of the head. While in the chain pickerel, that snout length is almost always greater than or equal to the post orval length of the head. On about 75% of grass pickerel, the maxilla will extend past the interior margin of the eye, while in about 75% of the chain pickerel specimens, that maxilla does not extend past the interior margin of the eye. It's really only the young juvenile chain pickerel that will get confused with grass pickerel because grass pickerel will never have the chain link pattern found on subadult and adult chain pickerel. As far as the young juveniles, at about one to three inches, the grass pickerel will have a straighter, thicker, and more consistent bright lateral band, while on the chain pickerel, that lateral band will almost always be thinner, wavier, and probably even broken. Around five to six inches, it'll be easier to count the meristics to tell them apart, and the grass pickerel will be showing almost full adult pattern by the size, which means there should be some of that classic vermiculated pattern. And the grass pickerel is more likely to still show an almost complete lateral band, which should never be on a six inch chain pickerel. While on a chain pickerel of this size, the pattern is a bit less erratic. The barring on the dorsal side looks cleaner and less patchy. It's the three to five inch range where the two patterns may be indistinguishable because the broken lateral band could be there on both species and both species are transitioning and patterning. But just keep an eye out for the forming chain links. Sometimes chain links or even elongated ovals start to show up fairly young on the underside of young chain pickerel. So some of these specimens will require examining all the meristics, all the morphometrics, and the patterning and coloration as well. Most adult chain pickerel won't exceed 24 inches in total length. There was a report of a 39 inch specimen, but that might not be verifiable as pure species. Most all state angling records are just above or below 30 inches. Any specimen larger than 22 inches should be considered a nice catch, and it probably is at least five to six years old. And you can find chain pickerel in a variety of habitat types. Densely vegetated, calm waters are the preferred habitat type. Sluggish rivers, creeks, lakes, ponds, channels, and wetlands may all hold chain pickerel. The chain pickerel can survive in moderately alkaline to very acidic water. It might even be found in brackish waters. I'm gonna lose my voice at this rate, but let's move on to the redfin pickerel, a subspecies of the American pickerel. So both subspecies of the American pickerel are separated by range, where the redfin pickerel is primarily in those Atlantic drainages and the grass pickerel is more in the lower half of the greater Mississippi River Basin drainage there though a fairly broad intergrade zone exists in the Gulf Slope drainages between the Biloxi River in Mississippi and the St. Johns River in Florida. So when Crossman extensively studied the American pickerel subspecies, he suggested attempting to identify specimens to the subspecies level in this region is impossible. And these specimens should, in most all cases, be regarded only as American pickerel Esox americanus. Also, Crossman predicted that intergrades would start to appear in this zone and I'm fairly sure he's right after I found an observation of an intergrade looking specimen on iNaturalist. And I will do a 
grass times redfin comparison near the end here. The redfin pickerel has that mostly scaled cheek and that mostly scaled operculum, just like the other pickerels. The lateral scale count is fairly low, usually in the high 90s to a below 110, with a known range of 94 to 117. The submandibular pores are extremely difficult to see on this species, so grab a magnifying glass. I should have used my micro lens instead on this shot because it is so hard to tell. The submandibular pore counts are usually 4 to 4, sometimes 4 to 3, 4 to 5, rarely anything else. And the branchiosical rays are almost always between 11 to 14 with a little bit of variation there. Again, as we discussed in the chain pickerel section of this video, the redfin pickerel has a very short snout, the shortest in the genus. It's almost convex rather than concave. Also, that maxilla usually extends at least past the interior margin of the pupil. It's very far. And it's usually only on juveniles and some subadults where that maxilla won't yet reach the pupil. The patterning of this fish is highly variable, but usually with some sort of irregular wavy bars along the body. The species usually doesn't achieve adult patterning until about five or six inches. Young juveniles have a very bright lateral bar, dark blotches at the base of the caudal fin, and even some red blotches in that caudal fin. Also notice that juveniles will not yet have red fins. Rather, they'll just have a little bit of color at the base of the fins. The red fin pickerel will retain that teardrop throughout life. And keep in mind that these species, especially the pickerels, can have their pattern, their colors flare up and down. So you could potentially catch a red fin pickerel and it's got 13 wavy bars on the side. 30 seconds later, it's almost patternless and it appears just like a brown body. They flare up, they flare down. Adults are typically gonna be around five to eight and a half inches. There's a reporting of almost a 15 inch specimen from Florida, but that was probably an intergrade and would just be considered an American pickerel rather than the subspecies, redfin pickerel. Redfin pickerel almost exclusively inhabit areas with dense vegetation and calm waters. Uh, swamps, backwaters, quiet streams are preferred. The species may also be found in ponds and lakes and less so in rivers with slow waters. Uh, the species is known to tolerate a wide range of pH uh, from acidic to neutral to basic, but typically is known to inhabit more acidic stained waters. And it may occasionally be found in brackish waters. Oh, we're almost done. Esox americanus from Miculatus, the grass pickerel. Let's get into it. The grass pickerel is the other subspecies of the American pickerel. The range is fairly large, extending all the way from southern Quebec down to Louisiana. There's even a range extending through Nebraska there. Now let's use the four. Again, like all pickerels, mostly scaled cheek, mostly scaled operculum. I hope you have that down by now, at least that. The lateral scale count will usually be in the mid-90s to 110. The submandibular pore counts will almost always be four to four, where four, three, four, five are not terribly uncommon. It's fairly rare for a grass pickerel to show 10 or 11 submandibular pores. That branchiosical ray count will be fairly low where 15 to 16 counts are pretty rare. We already did a bunch of grass pickerel chain pickerel comparisons, but again, to quickly summarize, remember that the snout length on the grass pickerel will most often be less than the postorbital length of the head. While on the chain pickerel, that snout length is usually equal to or greater than the postorbital length of the head. Some juvenile and sub-adult grass pickerel I analyzed actually had a slightly longer snout length than the postorbital length of the head, so there is overlap here. And also remember that the maxilla will often extend past the interior margin of the eye on grass pickerel while on the chain pickerel, that maxilla usually doesn't extend past the interior margin of the eye. Remember the branchiostical ray counts and the lateral line counts are best for distinguishing these two species. Young and adult grass pickerel will have very different patterns and coloration. That two inch juvenile shows that bright distinct lateral band and the red and black blotches in the caudal fin while the subadults and adults will usually have some irregular barring patterns that usually connect from the dorsum to the belly. Though some specimens will just have inconsistent blotching or even no real pattern. Remember that these esophagids can flare their patterns up and down. And grass pickerel can be found in various habitat types, but almost always are associated with dense vegetation, small streams, swamps, drainage ditches, and slow moving water systems or preferred habitats. This species can tolerate a wide range of pH uh, and is usually found in the more basic waters. 
So let's briefly talk about intergrades and grass pickerel versus redfin pickerel. So intergrades are not hybrids. They're just populations that have mixed genetics between two different groups or two different subspecies in this case. And that's probably because some thousands and thousands of years ago, after the American pickerel had already split into these subspecies, there was a secondary introduction. The two populations came back together right in this area. Genes got swapped between grass pickerel and redfin pickerel for a very long time. And so now we have intergrades. And these should, in most all cases, just be described as American pickerel rather than any of the subspecies levels. The main differences between the two subspecies are that the redfin pickerel maintains that shorter snout that is often more convex rather than concave. The redfin pickerel also has that maxilla extending farther back, usually always past the anterior margin of the pupil, while in the grass pickerel, it usually does not extend that far. Also, the red and orange fins of the redfin pickerel are fairly reliable color differences, especially redfin pickerel from the Carolinas. Those are very bright red. On the grass pickerel, the fins on the adults and subadults will have color, but typically it's a dusky yellow or amber color in the fins and doesn't quite approach that orange or definitely not the red. Finally, redfin pickerel have more cardioid scales compared to grass pickerel. These scales can be observed pretty easily on the side of the body underneath the dorsal fin origin, but perhaps most easily just by looking at the triangular area between the pelvic fins. These cardioid scales are not scales, sometimes even with more notches than seen here. On the grass pickerel, the scales are just rounded. Usually redfin pickerel are covered in these scales. And in this area, you'll often see at least six and up to 30 cardioid scales, while in the grass pickerel, it's never more than three or four, if any at all. So when Crossman did his big study, he just figured out that the intergrades had intermediate features between uh, all those features I just mentioned. So you can just check for that. Range is really what's gonna be most helpful for determining the intergrades. Though there are some isolated populations in that intergrade zone that almost entirely have features resembling the redfin pickerel, but are still probably just genetic intergrades. But intergrades tend to have fins with the intermediate color in the fins. The snout lengths will be intermediate, the maxillal extension intermediate, and the number of cardioid scales intermediate. And now it's quite possible that the redfin pickerel and grass pickerel ranges have expanded since Crossman examined this 50, 60 years ago. I also put fishing tips on each one of the individual species pages on the website. Fish responsibly and good luck. Oh my goodness. Thank <laughs> you.